Hello, students of history and political science. I'm Mr. Tesh, and welcome to Global Chat, where we explore the ins and outs of the field of study known as comparative politics. In this video, I'm going to give a presentation on Mexico. First, we're going to take a look at the institutions that make up Mexico's political system. Then, I'm going to walk you through some of Mexico's political history to kind of show you some of its key features and how it got to be the way that it is today. Let's start by taking a look at Mexico's state institutions. We're going to talk in detail about these things, but we should have a glance at some of the key facts of Mexico's system of government. First, it's important to know that Mexico is a presidential democracy. Now, for a good chunk of its history, Mexico really only had one political party that dominated its political system called the PRI, or PRI. Today, Mexico is quickly becoming a vibrant and competitive democracy. Mexico is constitutionally federal and is made up of 31 states and its capital, Mexico City. It has a bicameral legislature that uses a mixed electoral system, and it's really a rather convoluted electoral system, I should say. And Mexico has a president who is elected by a plurality of the popular vote, although there are some interesting aspects to that that we're going to talk about later as well. Let's start by taking a look at the executive branch. Currently, Andres Manuel López Obrador is Mexico's president. He was elected in 2018 and is the leader of a relatively new political party in Mexico called Morena. Like other presidential systems that we've learned about, Mexico's elected president serves as both head of state and head of government. That gives him a number of important powers. For one thing, Mexico's president has the power to approve domestic legislation, meaning that he can also veto laws passed by the national legislature. The president is also responsible for Mexico's foreign policy, so he can enter into agreements with foreign countries, declare war and peace, things like that. And he's the commander-in-chief, which means that he's in charge of Mexico's military. Now, one unique feature of Mexico's presidency is that he or she is restricted to serving a single term in office. In a minute, we're going to talk about some advantages and disadvantages of this. But I personally think that one of the most important roles that Mexico's president has is that of leading the federal bureaucracy. And that's something we're going to take a look at in the next slide here. So all presidential systems that we study feature a cabinet that is mostly responsible to the elected president. Cabinet members are always selected by a president, and then usually have to be approved by the legislature in some way. In the United Kingdom, which is a parliamentary democracy, we also learn about a cabinet. But there, they are members of the House of Commons, who are chosen by and serve in the prime minister's government. Most of what governments do today, they do through large bureaucratic institutions. In Mexico, there are a bunch of really important departments that carry out the tasks of day-to-day -day governance. Agencies like the Department of Foreign Affairs, the Department of Social Development, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Education, Department of Energy, Department of Environment, and a whole bunch of others do things that ordinary citizens need in their day-to-day -day lives, even if they aren't always consciously aware of it. In order for a bus network or a subway system to be expanded, people somewhere in some department of transportation have to organize that and get the funds for those projects in place, for example. In order for phone or internet services to be provided in some remote part of a country, somebody in the Department of Communications has to make sure that the infrastructure for that exists. It's the members of the president's cabinet who head up these different government agencies and who make these kinds of things happen. Who presidents decide to put in charge of these important departments has a whole lot to do with how the government will go about providing the basic public goods and services that people rely on. We should also briefly talk about presidential elections. Mexico's presidents are elected by a plurality of the popular vote. This means that they don't necessarily need to win a majority or more than 50% of the popular vote, just more votes than the other candidates in the race. This is different from Russia and Iran, where candidates have to win at least 50% of the vote in order to win the election. If they don't, a second round of voting is held called a runoff election. In Mexico, though, there have been quite a few candidates that have become president with less than 50% of the vote. 
For most of the 1900s, PRI candidates were winning Mexico's elections by really big margins. In 1982, Miguel de la Madrid won with an astounding 74% of the public's support. By 1988, though, things were changing, and President Carlos Salinas de Gortari barely eked out a win with just over 50% of the vote. And there were some serious allegations of election fraud there that we're going to talk about a little bit later. In 1994, again, Ernesto Zedillo won with barely 50% of the vote. And in 2000, a candidate from a political party other than the PRI won for the very first time in Mexico's history, Vicente Fox of the PAN, or Partido Acción Nacional, a conservative pro-business party that we're going to talk a lot about later. Fox won with a mere 43% of the public support, but still more than other candidates in the race. Now, in 2006, President Felipe Calderón assumed office after winning just 36% of the public support. And his successor, Enrique Peña Nieto, in 2012, didn't do much better when he won just 38% of the vote. With so little support, we say that a president doesn't have what we call a clear national mandate. In order to really represent a constituency or group of people, a leader who wins more than half of the vote clearly has a more legitimate mandate to govern than one who does not. This is one of the key principles of representative democracy. I said earlier that Mexico's presidents are limited to a single term. There's a reason that's written into Mexico's constitution, and it really does have some advantages. For one, it really reduces the incumbent president's re-election advantage. All over the world, presidents that run for re-election usually win. There's probably a few reasons for this, one being that incumbents have a lot of name recognition and likely receive a lot of votes because of it. Single-term limits might also enhance the public's perception that the executive isn't simply pandering to win re-election and can exercise independent judgment. But on the flip side, executive term limits come with some hefty downsides that we should talk about. For one thing, they force good executives to leave office. Even a president who's perceived as very competent and very capable uh, is forced to leave office after it's just a single term. Term limits can also allow insufficient time for an officeholder to achieve his or her policy goals, and those goals could be also be interrupted by a successor who overturned some of the things that president did. Interestingly, while we might think of an executive who doesn't have to pander to his voter base as a good thing, this can also weaken accountability for that executive, as they won't be held accountable for their actions at the next election. In the case of President Enrique Peña Nieto, we can also see what happens when the president's political party doesn't also control either one or both houses of Congress. This can lead to what is known as a lame duck period for the officeholder, where his or her policy priorities can't be accomplished because of gridlock. Personally, I feel that the disadvantages of executive term limits outweigh the advantages and often lead to unwanted and unforeseen obstacles that inhibit effective policymaking and governance. Later, we're going to talk about how that became a problem in Mexico's legislature as well. Like Nigeria and Russia, Mexico is constitutionally federal, meaning that power is shared between the national government and its 31 state governments. Each state elects its own governor, Congress, and has its own court systems as well. Federalism plays an important role in how Mexico runs its national legislative elections, too. So, Mexico's citizens have the right to elect members of the Congress of the Union, which is Mexico's national legislature. Like the United Kingdom and Russia, Mexico has a bicameral legislature. One house is called the Senate, and the other is called the Chamber of Deputies. You can think of Mexico's Chamber of Deputies as kind of like the House of Representatives in the United States, or the Federation Council in Russia, except that it is made of of 500 members who each serve three-year terms. Of these 500 members, 300 are elected from single-member district constituencies based on plurality, and the other 200 are elected based on proportional representation. Elections for Mexico senators are even more complicated. So, The way it works is that each of Mexico's 31 states and Mexico City elect three senators. Political parties run two candidates, and voters cast a ballot for the political party they feel best represents them. The winning party in each state wins the first two seats, and then the political party that comes in second place wins the one remaining seat. This all adds up to about 96 seats, but there are another 32 seats in the Senate that are elected by proportional representation, based on party support in a nationwide vote. 
Each of Mexico's states has a broad array of powers within their own borders as well. So Mexico has truly become what we can call functionally federal. State governors and legislators only serve a single term, although they can run for an additional non-consecutive terms in office. I want to talk now about Mexico's national legislature. Like in all of the countries that we study, the legislature is the branch of government that creates law. I wanted to share this photo with you because I think it's a really great way to visualize the law and policymaking process in Mexico. This is a meeting of the Congress of the Union. The picture was taken in the auditorium where the Chamber of Deputies meets. What's really special about this photo is that the man speaking on the left is Vicente Fox, who was Mexico's president from 2000 to 2006. Like all presidents, Fox didn't have the power to just enact whatever laws he wanted in order to accomplish his policy priorities. That's not really the president's job. Ultimately, presidents have to rely on a Congress and then have the ability to approve or veto whatever legislation they can agree to. But while presidents are not the makers of law and policy, they can definitely communicate their priorities to Congress, what they're willing to sign into law and what they would veto and things like that. This relationship between the executive and legislature in a presidential democracy is an important check on power that is really there by design. So we've already talked about how the houses of Mexico's national legislature are elected differently, but they have different powers as well. The elected upper house, the Senate, has some really important powers. For one thing, it has the power to confirm presidential appointments to the Supreme Court, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. This is actually a pretty important power because Supreme Court magistrates serve 15-year terms in Mexico. The Senate must also approve treaties, which are agreements between states and are usually initiated by the president. Mexico's Senate also has the power to approve federal intervention in state matters. The Chamber of Deputies is equally important, but has some of its own unique powers. For one thing, it has to approve legislation passed by the Senate. It also has the ability to levy taxes, and it verifies the outcomes of elections. We're going to talk in a minute about some of the laws that have been enacted by Mexico's legislature in recent years. For now, let's talk about some recent changes to the term limits for Mexico's lawmakers. From 1929 until 2014, Mexico's legislators were constitutionally limited to a single term in office. For the Chamber of Deputies, that meant just one three-year term, and for the Senate, just one six-year term. As we mentioned when we discussed executive term limits, there are some real disadvantages to these kinds of restrictions. Three years really isn't a lot of time in a position as important as being a member of the Chamber of Deputies. There's an old saying that Mexico's lawmakers spend the first year learning the ropes, the second year doing their jobs, and the third year seeking another position. In many ways, Mexican legislators were always amateurs at governance whose primary policy goal uh, was to lobby for another government job, because they knew their term would be over in no time. Because of this, President Enrique Peña Nieto signed reforms into law in 2014 that would allow members of the Chamber of Deputies to serve four three-year terms for a total of up to 12 years in office. Senators are now allowed to serve two six-year terms, meaning that they can also serve for up to 12 years. These policy changes will hopefully lead to more experienced legislators. Hopefully, the incentive of potentially being re-elected will also make lawmakers more responsive to the public's demands. 2014 was an important year for reforms to Mexico's legislature in another way as well. So, like most countries of the world, Mexican politics had always been dominated by men. In February of 2014, Mexico passed a constitutional amendment to Article 41 of the federal constitution requiring that political parties develop rules to ensure gender equality in the nomination of candidates in federal and local congressional elections. This means that the political parties were now required by law to alternate between women and men on the candidate lists that they submit for elections. As you can see in the charts below, Mexico's legislature is today divided almost entirely equally between men and women. There is some hope that over time, this policy will bring about changes that produce gender equality across Mexican society more broadly, too. The Supreme Court of Justice is the highest court in Mexico's judiciary. It has both the power of judicial review and it is the highest court of appeals, making it an incredibly powerful institution. For most of the 1900s, appointment to the Supreme Court was part of the PRI's patron-client network. 
Supreme Court judges were appointed because they were owed favors by important and powerful people within the party structure. That was until 1995, when reforms created a system of examinations for judges who had to prove their qualifications to be nominated. Like I said earlier, Supreme Court judges also have to be approved by the Senate, giving Congress an important check on the president's power over the court. Because of these reforms, Mexico's Supreme Court has become increasingly independent in recent years. In 2018, Enrique Peña Nieto signed the Internal Security Act passed by Congress into law. This act essentially gave the president the power to use the military to try to bring an end to some of the drug cartel violence that had become a very serious problem in Mexico. Later that same year, though, Mexico's Supreme Court ruled that civil institutions are responsible for providing security to the country's citizens, and that the military is not a police force. They argued that soldiers should not be used as a substitute for the police, and that Mexico's armed forces shouldn't be in charge of the country's domestic security. This ruling overturned the new law, and was really a test of the Supreme Court's ability to act as a check on the executive. And it looks as though we are going to continue to see Mexico's Supreme Court upholding the rule of law. At this point, I want to transition to talking about Mexico's political history. Now, what I don't want to do is get bogged down in every little historical development of the last several decades. There are just too many of them, and it won't really help our understanding of Mexican politics if we do that. Instead, I want to focus on some key historical events that have transformed Mexico's political system and made it what it is today. I want to start by looking at Mexico's major political parties, because it is through their priorities and the power given to them by Mexican voters that things get really interesting. Then I'm going to focus primarily on changes to the relationship between the state and the economy that have taken place in Mexico since the 1980s. Mexico's economy has really taken off in the last several decades, and the country is now on track to becoming a wealthy country with a vibrant democracy. I'm especially interested in the role that policy changes like economic liberalization and responses to globalization have made that possible. The PRI, or Institutional Revolutionary Party, was formed after the Mexican Revolution and held power for 71 years from 1929 until 2000. For all of that time, it held power in both national and state governments. In the past, the PRI operated as a party of power, with no definitive ideology. In the 1900s, the party was ideologically flexible, at times embracing state-driven economic policies such as land reform and then diving toward market-based capitalist reforms. This emphasis on capitalist and globalizing reforms continues today, while the party also advocates for welfare policies to address the needs of lower-class Mexicans. Because of this, it's largely the working class in Mexico's central region who vote for the PRI today. The PRD, or Democratic Revolutionary Party, is a more leftist political party in Mexico that broke away from the PRI after the 1988 election. The party emphasizes human rights and social justice for disadvantaged groups. Because of that, it tends to get its support from poor and indigenous Mexicans today. The PAN, or National Action Party, was formed in 1939 and has always been the PRI's opposition to the right. The PAN has supported a right-leaning ideology in economic terms, including things like free enterprise, privatization of national industries, more free trade, and small government in general. Because of this, the PAN or PAN draws a lot of support from business owners and middle-class Mexicans. But the PAN is also socially conservative and has stances against abortion and same-sex marriage and things like that. Because of that, a large population of Catholic voters in Mexico also tend to support the PAN. Morena is unique because it was created by Andres Manuel López Obrador after he lost the 2012 election for president. It was registered as a political party in 2014, and its members won several seats in the Chamber of Deputies in the following year. In 2018, it competed in the presidential election for the first time, with Obrador at the top of the ticket. But let's start off our little political history of Mexico by taking a look at the political and economic context of Mexico's development in the 20th century. So in the middle of the 1900s, Mexico would have been considered a developing country. In political terms, Mexico did not have a vibrant democracy, but appeared to be more of a democracy in name only that was dominated by a single political party, 
In economic terms, Mexico is largely agricultural, especially when we compare it to the rapidly expanding economy of its neighbor to the north, the United States. But beginning in the 1950s, something started to happen that economists refer to as the Mexican miracle. From 1954 on, Mexico's economy was incredibly productive, and its gross domestic product grew at a rate well over 4% per year for most of those decades. In that time, developing countries all over the world looked to Mexico as kind of a model for how they hoped to solve some of their own economic troubles. If we look at this line chart that I've made here, we can see that between 1971 and 1982, Mexico's GDP grew at a rate of over 4% almost every single year. But then, in 1982, something very clearly goes wrong as productivity drops off sharply. It turns out that Mexico's economic growth was based on its extraction and export of oil. In 1982, a decline in oil demand all over the world led to rapidly falling oil prices that pulled Mexico's economy into a recession. What happened to Mexico's economy here is what political scientists sometimes refer to as a consequence of the resource trap or the resource curse. So much of Mexico's economy depended on the extraction and sale of a natural resource, in this case oil, that any change to that resource's price or availability posed a serious threat to Mexico's economy as a whole. Economies that have a larger variety of goods and services that they produce tend to be more robust, and policymakers play a role in helping achieve this. When Miguel de la Madrid was elected president in 1982, he inherited this massive economic challenge. Mexico was on the hook for loans that it had taken to develop its oil industry, and now its economy was really struggling. In order to pay off the debt that Mexico had incurred, Miguel de la Madrid looked to the International Monetary Fund, which is headquartered in Washington, D.C. The IMF agreed to a set of loans to help Mexico avoid default, but in exchange required a set of reforms to Mexico's economy that we call structural adjustments. In essence, these reforms are what we refer to as economic liberalization, or reducing the role of the state in the economy. The IMF required that Mexico reduce government spending on the salaries and benefits of government employees, privatize state-owned industries, and liberalize its trade policy. Over the course of his presidency, Miguel de la Madrid's administration carried out these reforms, but GDP growth remained incredibly slow while inflation skyrocketed. For average Mexican citizens, this created a very challenging situation where they watched the cost of living go up, while at the same time opportunities for them declined. All of these challenges paved the way for one really contested and corrupt election in 1988. The 1988 election of President Carlos Salinas de Gortari is really notorious and well-known, not only because it was corrupt, but because the level of fraud and cheating in that election became publicly known. As the results for the election were being counted, the government reported that the computers doing the counting had crashed. Right before the crash, the leftist opposition appeared to be winning. But when the computers came back online, it appeared that Carlos Salinas de Gortari of the PRI was again the frontrunner. In 2004, former President Miguel de la Madrid admitted to what pretty much every observer already suspected. The election was in fact rigged. And in 1991, the PRI had burned all of the election ballots to hide the evidence. One major policy achievement of Carlos Salinas de Gortari's administration was signing the North American Free Trade Agreement, more commonly known as NAFTA in 1992. This was an agreement between Canada, Mexico, and the United States to reduce barriers to trade and investment. The hope was that such an agreement would stimulate trade between the three countries, increasing productivity and national income. And it worked. Since the agreement went into effect in 1994, cross-border investment and trade have grown sharply for the three member states, as have their economies overall. The idea for NAFTA was first part of Ronald Reagan's presidential campaign in 1980, and became a reality when an initial trade agreement was signed in 1988. What's really important to understand about NAFTA is that it is really was an acknowledgement that the world is becoming increasingly interdependent in economic terms. Goods that are produced in one country are shipped to and sold all over the world, and resources that are extracted in another country are used in many other countries to produce other goods still. And on and on this goes. This process has been accelerating, and is what we call globalization. NAFTA reduced restrictions on trade between three neighboring countries that have become one of the largest trading blocks in the world today.
Now, this is a really good time to mention that beginning in 2017, NAFTA was renegotiated by the three member countries and is now known as USMCA, or the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement. Not much has changed about the original agreement, and many analysts are simply calling it NAFTA 2.0. NAFTA created lots of opportunities for multinational corporations to take advantage of lower-cost Mexican labor to produce goods rather cheaply. The factories that do this in Mexico are often known as maquiladoras, and Mexico has created special programs to allow these factories to export goods without duties or taxes. Maquiladoras employ millions of Mexican workers today, and they have certainly played an important role in Mexico's economic development. The downside, though, is that working conditions in these factories are often poor, and the wages of maquiladora workers have remained relatively low. But because of NAFTA, hundreds of maquiladoras were built in the 1990s, and a huge amount of goods that are sold in the United States today are made or assembled in Mexico. Even America's largest car manufacturer, General Motors, has billions of dollars worth of cars that are assembled in Mexico every single year. And they do this because, of course, the cost of labor is so much lower in Mexico than it is in the United States. But not everyone is a fan of free trade. Economic liberalization can lead to rising economic inequality, and this can create some political consequences. So southern Mexico has a large population of farmers and indigenous people who have largely been left out of the economic expansion that's been enjoyed by Mexico's more industrialized urban centers. In 1994, and on the same day that the NAFTA agreement went into effect, a group of rebels called the Zapatistas started an armed uprising against the Mexican government in the southern state of Chiapas. Resistance by Zapatistas to government projects in southern Mexico continue even today. The Zapatista uprising is just one symptom of a broader set of ethnic divisions that exists in Mexican society today. Mexico has about 12.7 million indigenous people who represent about 13% of the national population and speak over 60 different languages. The majority of the indigenous population is concentrated in Mexico's poorer regions in the south. Many indigenous Mexican people have tried to maintain their culture and livelihoods. Others have witnessed the collapse of their traditions under the burden of poverty and have started to lose their ethnic identity as they've tried to integrate into mestizo society to try and improve their living conditions. Despite some attempts at reform, many indigenous people in Mexico still experience discrimination, both because of their low economic standing and poor levels of formal education, but also because of their language and the way they dress. What little land they own is generally not enough to support them, so many seek waged work from mestizo employers, who in many cases treat them disrespectfully. So as we can see from the Zapatista uprising, these ethnic tensions have some really important implications for Mexican politics and are going to continue to play an important role in shaping local and national government in Mexico. Let's turn our attention back to Mexico's electoral politics. Throughout the 1990s, Mexico enacted a series of political reforms intended to increase political competition and democratic participation. Perhaps most importantly, Mexico created an independent electoral commission called the Federal Election Institute in 1994 to attempt to reduce voter fraud and enhance electoral competition. In 2014, President Enrique Peña Nieto expanded the powers of the agency, and it was renamed the National Electoral Institute. The National Electoral Institute, or INE, oversees the registration and funding of political parties. It also confirms election results, registers voters, and it even provides citizens with transportation to polling places. In this way, the INE has a great deal of power over Mexico's national and local elections, and it ensures that these elections are fair and free of corrupt influence. This has been a really important organization that has made it possible for Mexico to democratize. The National Electoral Institute was also key in bringing about the decline of the PRI in Mexican politics. Today, Mexico has a multi-party system, with four major political parties competing for majorities in both chambers of the Congress of the Union. It's also worth mentioning that since 2000, presidents from three different political parties have won the presidency. The power and influence of the Institutional Revolutionary Party has slowly eroded since about the 1980s. Having managed to cling to power for a record-setting 71 years, the PRI lost the presidential election for the first time in 2000. Mexico citizens first became disillusioned with the PRI during the economic hardships of the 1980s. 
After the massive fraud of the 1988 election, many Mexican voters started voting against the party. In the 2000 election, Mexico was ready for a president from a different political party, and in this case, the National Action Party. Vicente Fox ran on an economically and socially conservative policy platform, building a coalition of Catholic voters and business owners in northern Mexico. But as astounding as his victory was, Fox won the election with only 43% of the popular vote, so we can't really say that he had a clear national mandate. As a pro-business president, one of Fox's priorities was to attempt to privatize Pemex, Mexico's largest and most important industry. It turns out that in comparison with international competitors like ExxonMobil, Shell, BP, Pemex was really rather inefficient, which in practical terms translates to less profit per barrel of oil extracted and produced. In order to try and make Pemex more competitive, Fox hoped to at least partially privatize the company. The hope was that making Pemex accountable to shareholders would create incentives to cut costs and maximize profits. But Fox was unable to get his agenda passed through Congress. The trouble is that the Mexican Constitution forbids private investment in Pemex. It's been this way since 1938, when President Lazaro Cardenas kicked foreign oil companies out of Mexico for not respecting labor laws. So unless there's constitutional change, it looks like Pemex is going to remain a state-owned company. Six years after the end of Fox's term, President Enrique Peña Nieto also tried to enact reforms to make Pemex more profitable and efficient. Peña Nieto campaigned with the PRI and won the presidency with only 39% of the popular vote. Peña Nieto was ultimately able to pass some very limited reforms to the oil market. Today, foreign oil exploration companies are allowed to drill in Mexico. This competition should create incentives for Pemex to become a more efficient producer. But Mexico's government also depends on Pemex, which pays about half of its revenue to the government in taxes. That's a really significant part of the government's annual revenue, and so Peña Nieto is in a tricky position when it comes to Pemex. In 2017, the government reduced subsidies to Pemex, which drove up the price of gasoline by 20% or so. This led to some very large protests in Mexico City, which ultimately contributed to the PRI's major losses at the polls in the 2018 election. The 2018 election in Mexico was really surprising to observers of Mexican politics. Back in 2006, the mayor of Mexico City, Andres Manuel López Obrador, ran for president against the National Action Party candidate Felipe Calderón and lost by a razor-thin margin. AMLO claimed that this loss was the result of election fraud, and four years afterwards, he denied the legitimacy of the 2006 election leading his supporters in weeks of street protests and things like that. In 2012, Obrador ran against Enrique Peña Nieto, performing a little better and winning about 32% of the popular vote. In all of these elections, Obrador ran as a Democratic Revolutionary Party candidate. But then in 2012, Obrador creates this interest group known as Morena, which is an acronym for National Regeneration Movement. The organization was only registered as a political party in 2014, but what really made it a potent political force in Mexico is that it brought together a coalition of leftists and the evangelical right in Mexico. By advocating for social justice, expanding education, and large government investments in social programs, Morena finds a good deal of support among poor, rural, and urban Mexican voters. But the party also formed an alliance with the Social Encounter Party, or PES, which is socially conservative and opposed to the legalization of same-sex marriage, for example. When he won the election with 53% of the popular vote, AMLO had a pretty significant mandate. In his first year in office, Obrador and the Congress created scholarships for students and apprentices, new disability and old age pensions, passed subsidies for farmers, created a small business loan program, and even launched a public bank to get benefits to Mexico's poor. With these kinds of programs, Obrador remains popular in Mexico, although he faces massive challenges in terms of drug violence. No matter who served as president in Mexico, a major challenge for the Mexican government continues to be the drug violence on a really quite massive scale. Across the country, but especially in northern Mexico, drug cartels compete over distribution networks into the United States. In many instances, the drug cartels even bribe city officials and the police to look the other way, 
which is part of the problem of corruption that Mexico faces today. Tens of thousands of Mexicans have died as a result of the drug violence that continues. There have been concerns that Mexico could become what's called a narco state, which is where the state has less power than the drug gangs. At the moment, the situation seems to be somewhat more stable, but that has been after enormous efforts by the Mexican military to carry out this so-called war on drugs. This is likely going to continue to be a problem for Mexico and its government for the foreseeable future at least. So in this presentation, we've talked about a lot. Mexico is obviously a fascinating country with an interesting political culture and a dynamic political system. A few important things stand out to me as to what we can learn from Mexico as we study comparative politics. First, election systems and term limits can really have an important impact on a government's legitimacy and effectiveness. Second, reforms such as gender quotas and independent electoral oversight agencies can be instrumental in making a system of government more democratic and more representative. And finally, economic development has really been crucial in Mexico's transition away from one-party rule to becoming a more competitive democracy today. Well, that's it this time. If you want to support our channel, you can subscribe to catch more of our videos. Tune in next time for a presentation on Iran. Thank you for watching, and see you soon. Thank you.